So let us clarify a little bit what exactly a production designer does, because I'm sure not many of us know really yeah, which I mean, areas do you... We're responsible for everything physical on that you see up there, so, except for costumes. And what's physical? Because so we, you can't tell. We have to take the script, and we work with the director, and we have to dream what it should be, and the space and the environments, the walls. We have to create the world. And then we have to, a big part of my job is to actually physically go and do it. And we have to use, uh, we use a lot of uh, realistic processes. So uh, it becomes very difficult. So every image you see up there, I have a memory of standing on glaciers, standing on LaSalle Street, standing you know, with Christian Bale, that was 90 floors up on the Sears building. That truck flipped for real. You know, there's obviously the CGI, but we try and do a, uh, a mixed medium. So to try and make you, the audience, believe that you're in the environment without question, we try and, uh, like a magician, we try and deceive you with lots of different techniques. So in any one sequence, there might be 15 different processes from miniatures to CGI, to real locations, to physical effects, to build. Uh, and so it's, it's a complex job. <laughs> and how is CGI interfering with your job? Has your job changed over the years? Well, we, I mean, I work obviously with Christopher Nolan, and he, we work in IMAX. So we, we believe that when you go to the cinema, you should be immersed in the film. And, and, the, and, and what IMAX does is it pushes you into the film, but you can't, to do CGI on IMAX is like every frame, to scan a frame of IMAX is 178 megs. So really you have to do as much practically as you can. We only resort to CGI after we can't do it. And the question is, what can't you do? Um, and that's the way we look at it, uh, I think, CGI for most producers and studios, they just resort to it for many reasons because they can kick it down to post-production and they can sort it out down there. They can delay having to figure out the visuals of their film, um, which is fine for some films. We don't work like that. So we like to, uh, we, work, we work in Chris's garage. Uh, we work alone to try and figure out how to visually describe the script he writes. Uh, and then we try and figure out how to do it. So, you know, we don't, we built that Batmobile. It goes 100 miles per hour. It hasn't got an electric motor in, sorry, BMW. <laughs> uh, it's got a Chevy 450, but uh, it weighs two and a half tons. You know, it's, so we have to figure out how to do that. Um, uh, you know, and it gets like Dunkirk. Those cameras were strapped to a, uh, the wing of a yak, a Russian yak, a two-seater. So that's the actor in, in a yak being filmed as he banks over Dunkirk. So we build a Spitfire cockpit in the front seat of a yak. You know, so we're flying, you know, we're, we're achieving those shots in camera. So that, I'm not saying the CGI method is wrong. I'm saying we don't believe in relying on one technology. So we've got 100 years of film experience. We use miniatures, we use CGI, we use full size. Uh, so it, it's, it's a mixed medium to get the best image. And really it's for you guys, so when you watch these films, you sit on the big screen and you never, you, you never get distracted because the visuals take you out of it. You're supposed, we're supposed to go as production, I believe, we're supposed to go unnoticed as production designers. So we're, you're not supposed to notice our work. You're just supposed to be on Dunkirk Beach. You're supposed to be in space with the endurance. You're supposed to be in Gotham. Uh, and if I don't put you there, I've failed. So, uh, you know, that's really our task. I, there's no right or wrong in production design, but that's what we believe. So. And how did your, how did your career start? And at what point you met Christopher Nolan? How did you start working together? Uh, well, I started, uh, Margaret Thatcher just destroyed England and I came out of art school. And so I went to America and I got a job uh, at one of the studios drafting. 
Um, and I did that for a long time. And uh, I finally became a production designer. It's a long, long story. But uh, I was working in Slovakia on Behind Enemy Lines. And uh, I just finished that film. And we, I was on a, ended up on an aircraft carrier coming back into San Diego Harbor, which was exhausting. And the phone rang. And it said, hey, would you, is there any way you could come up to LA and meet this young guy who just finished his film, Memento? His name's Christopher Nolan. So we, I, uh, I went to meet him, and uh, we realized we kind of grew up in <laughs> like streets apart. So, <laughs> but I was older than him, so I only remember his brother. Who used, we used to stay away from his brother. So, <laughs> I I think that matters a lot if you can share uh, your identities somehow because you're both Europeans and, and yeah. grew up in the same area. That helps well. to connect. Yeah, and we both love, you know, we both, you know, we're massive fans of going, we were going down to Empire, you know, the Empire Leicester Square and seeing James Bond, you know. Yeah. I want to see films, I don't want to see them on, on my TV, I want to see them 90 foot wide, if they're good enough. <laughs> so. And how is the ratio uh, b between creativity and business in your case? Um, well, you know, a lot of it, so we dream in Chris's house, we dream up what we want to do, and then we have to, we, we have to get very uh, solidified in, in our process, uh, in that, that time in his house. And then when we come out, we have to deal with the studio, the crews, we have 300 crew, we have to convince everyone that we're not insane. So, and we really can do this, we really can, uh, you know, we can go to Iceland, we can build a walking robot like TARS, we can, you know, get the ranger into the sea and film it in the sea. So all we're doing is putting in a digital wave behind it. And the weather is rough. You know, we've, the number of storms, those images, <laughs> I've been the coldest, like the Dunkirk Pier got ripped apart by storm. So, but honestly, that adds to the image because there's no, computer guy in, in a room who can recreate what that film is getting because of the weather. And what is your, your dream job? Is there anything that you haven't done yet that you would like to make? I would like to do a James Bond, but I never get asked. <laughs> okay, now we have a statement here. <laughs> Hopefully they're gonna I've been hear trying to talk it. Chris into doing a James Bond, but he says no. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I would have liked to have done the Star Wars, but there's no beating the first one. So you can't do that. Uh, so we have to do original work, that's what's important. And how does a, a typical day of yours look like? You get up in the morning and what can we imagine, what do you do? Well, I get up uh, pretty early. Uh, I now, we now use old, and tech, old and new techniques. So we, we use a lot of miniatures, but we print them with uh, 3D machines. So we have a, a 3D fa farm in the art department. So. Um, uh, because the miniature company has gone out of business in the last 10 years, so that was printed in, with my four printers in my office. So, the, so I kind of go in and check that they've all been running, because you guys probably know about 3D printers. They break down all the time. So my day starts there, then I go and see construction, uh, usually special effects. I go and swing by Chris's office. I go with my art department, we're usually building in at least four places on location. And then I'd probably have to go to the airport because we're also doing the same in about three different countries. So uh, Interstellar was filmed in Iceland, uh, in LA, and in Canada. So you end up, you know, you end up on these planes, uh, which is actually fantastic because until recently, there was no internet and the phones didn't work. So it was a great quiet time to, you know, figure out what you were doing, but it's a lot of uh, dealing with people. It's a lot of, uh, you know, it's exhausting because you have to energize people to do uh, odd things. So um, the day is long. How long is the process once you are hired for your job? How much time do you have to plan ahead, to dream, as you say? until production starts, until production finishes, and then you start CGI? Uh, well, we usually do like three months in Chris's house, 
and then we, you know, we usually go into pre-production like December, January, and we usually do 12 weeks pre-production where we're initializing all these ideas, uh, and then we shoot for probably about 12 weeks, uh, and then we go into post-production. So uh, it's a quick pre-production, but uh, you know, the, the thing about films is that day one, you know, you, on a 12-week schedule, you can, you can push the things you need to do that are maybe tougher down to the end of the schedule. Like the Tesseract uh, in Interstellar was very, very, very difficult to design. And so none of us could kind of figure it out. Um, so <laughs> we kind of kept on leaving it and leaving it. Uh, we knew we had to we had to recreate the fourth dimension like you would move around this room in three dimensions, but you were moving in four, four dimensions. So, um, and we knew we had to build it. So the Tesseract is sort of based on the idea of a room, mo room moving through time, except for you are being of the fourth dimension, and you can look at it move through time on X, Y, Z. So all the shelves, all the furniture has to, it's a sculptural piece, basically. Um, but it took us a long time to get there, to sort of understand. So, you know, you push those things to the end of the schedule. It wasn't until we had a horrendous storm in Iceland and we got trapped in the hotel that we all sat down and figured that out. So, uh, you know, so you, anyway, this, what I was sort of saying is the schedule will allow you to find design time. It yeah. sounds like a long-term relationship that you have together. Um, can you disclose something about your next projects? I can't because I don't ask him. So <laughs> I, he's so secretive, we go and have lunch and it's like, you know, just don't tell me. Like, when, when, we, when you're ready, we'll we're, we're, we're go for it, so. But you, you only work with him or? No, I just finished um, First Man about the Neil Armstrong, uh, the moon landings. And that was with Damien Chazelle. Um, who uh, we had a great time, and he wanted to use sort of more traditional methods, so uh, we kind of had to fake the moon landings, so which was kind of super. It must odd. be challenging. <laughs> so, I think you can fake the moon landings, but but they didn't. So. What do you think uh, about the battle between television and cinema? If there is a battle, what do you think? I mean. You know, television's got, got the good writing. I think the films we're making right now, I think Hollywood filmmaking, I don't want to go and see Marvel films. Sorry, Marvel. I know you don't harm me anyway. So um, I don't want to go see those films. I, so TV uh, has some great stories, but the problem I have with TV is it's not cinematic. I want to go... I, the TV doesn't take... I want to go to cinema and be taken away. I want to be taken away and forget who I am for two and a half hours. And a, a film needs to do that. So uh, I don't really have a problem. I, I mean, I worked on Westworld, the pilot, uh, really is a, because I loved the original film and felt it was flawed because it got boring. Um, uh, and it was Jonah and uh, Nolan. So I did the pilot, but I don't really want to do TV. So um, just because I can't view it in the, the fashion I, I, I grew up on David Lean's films, and I, you know, I, I have to see something spectacular. <laughs> so what what your advice would be to these youngsters if some of them wanted to become a successful filmmaker or even a production designer? Uh, what it takes to be or to become a production designer? Um, you have to be a bit of a jack of all trades. So if you're not brilliant at anything, that's probably a plus. But if you, uh, and you have to be optimistic, massively optimistic. So, uh, because you, the minute you're pessimistic, it's like you'll, you'll give up. So you have to, uh, well, you have to have ideas. And the, the hardest thing for a designer is you're dealing with hundreds of people doing things towards that design every day. So you have to have a very fluid design process. And so you have to be open-minded and try and bring in everything you've put into your brain about the film. And ideally, you, 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 the best thing is to be running the film in your head visually. 
Um, and so you can, you can push it in the right direction. And you have to answer questions all day long, and you have to stand up on your feet all day. So you have to be prepared to, uh, you, you don't sit at a desk. Um, and you've got to, you know, so optimism, uh, enthusiasm, pushing people, even though it might be the wrong direction, you've got to keep things moving. So, because the train, the <laughs> filming train, is coming behind you. So the set has to be ready. Um, so there's a lot of. You How know, much luck is it? Is it? Well, there's a lot of luck. Like we, it's also the people. Like we were moving the Ranger, which is that long ship uh, from from the open wash of glacier wash, that endless sea that you see up there, uh, that's forth. We were moving it to the glacier. And, you know, we hadn't figured out, it was like, uh, oh shit, it's, it's wider than the road. And all the, all the signposts for 20 miles, we can't get it past them. So this Icelandic guy got off the truck with a, uh, a saw and just started cutting them down. So we cut down the signs for 20 miles. <laughs> So you need to find the right people. So the luck is finding the right people to help you. And it's like, you can't give up. You've got to get it to the glacier. We're going to film it tomorrow. So anyway. What do you do in your free time? Um, I, we, we walk. We walk all over New York. Uh, I've had to retrain myself in 3D. So I, I do a lot of learning. Uh, I'm always on the lookout for a good 3D printer. <laughs> um, and while we walk, and I go to museums a lot, I go and try and, uh, I do a lot, I guess we take in imagery, uh, and I try and bank it, because I knew, I know it will become useful somewhere. Uh, the trouble is the memory is getting worse, so I have to remember, <laughs> like some good reference. And what was the most difficult part of your career so far? What, if there is a specific episode that, um, that you I, can I think it was interstellar because it was, you know, it was fundamentally an enormous design job from just from the ship design or coming up with the 12 pods of the endurance, you know, that had to be like a survival, a lifeboat for humanity, you know, how they would come apart and the lander, how it would take those pods down to the, if they found a planet, how it, how the ships, the two rangers and the two landers would orient themselves and then you know how do we do zero g you know we we hung the sets uh, you know so it's very very complex and an enormous it was a design it really hurt my head the amount of design in it um because everything like even tars like how do you design a robot you know we you know there's been so many there's been how there's been humanoid stuff <laughs> there's been the detroit so it was it's like, what's our robot? You know, how do we, how do we find something interesting? And I remember Chris saying to me, because I'm a massive Mies van der Rohe fan, uh, I remember him saying, well, well, how would Mies van der Rohe design a robot? And I said, just have a, a metal block. That would be it. So that was, that was TARS. So, um, you know, the design content, very, very uh, uh, stressing. Uh, and then uh, Dunkirk in the opposite was very logistical, like, you know, it was very logistical. Uh, we had, we knew we had to go to Dunkirk Beach, and that was tricky. I mean, we're filming. We had to rebuild that pier. We had to get an armada of ships from all over. We got them from out of Norway, out of France, out of Holland. We went, you know, so we had to bring all these ships together, and they're all, you know, and then put them in the English Channel and film in the English Channel. So that was logistically hard. Interstellar was design-wise very difficult. So those. I always say it took us all the films leading up to Interstellar to be able to do Interstellar, and then it took the it took them all again to be able to do Dunkirk. So I'm a little bit wary of what we're going to do next. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing with us yeah. everything, and we have one more wee video to show you. So thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nathan Crowley. Nice guy. Thank you very much.